What up everybody, it's your boy Kentario and I'm back again for another episode of Christ and Comic Books. And the purpose of this channel is to see if we cannot find the gospel message of the Bible within anime, manga, and comic books as well as other such media. If you like the type of content that's being produced on this channel, please make sure you hit that subscribe button as well as the notification bell. That way you get heads up on any other media that I'll be putting out. Also, please make sure that you hit that like button because the like button will boost this channel within the YouTube algorithm. As well as, please make sure that you leave a comment in the comment section. If you have anything that you want to say about the video or response to the video, even if you disagree, because I love to hear your comments. Now the focus of today's video is going to be on the movie Thor, Love and Thunder. And today, well, that's what we're- Well, oh. well, well. I can't believe oh. we're about to record this. You're actually going to do this video. Didn't I warn you about doing this? This is the Come worst on, that's idea what I you do on this ever channel. Had. Please. You are about to risk your entire platform for something that you're the only person that sees this. And look, I- you, you sure? You sure? Oh, could you let me record my video? You. Quiet, right. quiet. Oh. Stop, please. En enough, okay? It's enough. <sighs> I don't care. Thank you. Okay, now, we're going to be talking about Thor, Love and Thunder Day. And, uh, simply put, I, I found the movie to be mid. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. What did he say? That's going to be my initial response. And when I say mid, I don't mean that it sucked. I mean that it wasn't extremely good. It wasn't extremely bad. It was just good. It was it's a good movie. It's not a movie that I would look to watch six and seven hundred times like I look at watching the Rush Hour franchise. One, two, and three. I could watch those movies over and over. But Thor 11 Thunder, it's just a good movie. Now, I can definitely also say that I see why a lot of the fans were upset with the movie. Yep. But at the same time, I can see a different side to that as well. So what we're going to do in today's video is we're going to hit on some of the highlights between what the fans were frustrated about and where they can reconcile in that area, as well as kind of highlight just some points of what I did and did not like in the movie. And we'll be ending this video by hitting on the Christian perspective, if there's anything that Christians can take away from this movie, as well as, is this movie a movie for Christians? And right now, I've got to tell you, I'm not so sure. Now what Thor Love and Thunder was looking to capitalize on was two different things and combining those things within one movie. One of the major aspects of that that a lot of fans were hyped to see and for some it was a disappointment, for others it did what it needed to do was the introduction of the female Thor, the new mighty Thor, one who wills Mjolnir where Thor himself wills Stormbreaker. Now with mighty Thor she was a of course Jane Foster who was sick with cancer but ended up acquiring the powers of Thor and of course this is coming from the comic book standpoint and just being simple with it but she stepped into the role of being Thor while Thor was traveling through space and being absent from the issues of the earth and she was operating as a hero there and later ends up reconciling with Thor partnering with him against evil particularly if I'm correct I believe the enemy was Surtur or somebody else but they partnered together in fighting him. And the outcome of this movie was kind of surmised to reflect that final battle and that outcome. As a matter of fact, in some sense, if I'm correct, she was also uh, has her part in the end of Ragnarok, according to the comic books, versus what we've seen within the MCU movie franchise. We have the introduction of one of the, arguably one of the most powerful Marvel enemies, villains, which in the entirety of the Marvel Universe, that being Gore the God Butcher. Pause. And he is being introduced in this movie as well, which has caused the biggest of controversy, dare I say, when it comes to Thor, Love and Thunder. Now, of course, when it comes to the comic books, who I have a better understanding of is Gore, being that they, he was someone that who comes from a race that believes in their gods, worship their gods, trust their decision of their gods, leading them from planet to planet, from source to source, to keep their people thriving and living. But once his people en encountered great turmoil, they, they began to kind of fall off and die off. And, and when he was at his lowest, he witnessed a battle between two gods. 
And in the midst of witnessing this battle, one of the gods, who was one that him and his people were praying to, was on the verge of death and was asking Gore for help instead. And instead of Gore helping him, Gore kills him because he sees as this, you, you're nothing special. You weren't able to be there for my people and at your lowest, now you're asking for my help when in fact me and my people, we needed you. That's how he ends up becoming Gore the God Butcher, whose sole purpose is to kill all of the, go the gods across the Marvel Universe. And now the way that he is, savage. He is extremely savage. And to be honest, that's one of the discrepancies that we see between Marvel comic book fans ending up watching Thor Love and Thunder is that they didn't get that version of Thor. That's the biggest thing that ended up becoming one of the major disappointments. Where Gore, actually, in the movie, ended up kind of seeing like your average villain. He's a person that suffered great trauma. A person who stepped into villainhood because of a certain level of betrayal. And because of that betrayal, he goes on this rampaging mission with this single-minded mindset to do exactly what it is that he's trying to do. Uh, he defeats the main heroes a couple of times and then ends up getting defeated in the end. And in some sense, changing his ways. What? Which is not necessarily the, the mindset and character of Gore the God Butcher. Gore the God Butcher in the comics was a bad dude. And when I say bad dude, just to highlight a couple of things, this guy had a god of torture begging for his life. That's how bad Gore the God Butcher was. Gore the God Butcher fought Thor on multiple occasions in Marvel Comics. He beat Thor twice and then ended up fighting three different versions of Thor from the past, present, and future and beat him, all three of them, practically twice. And when they defeated him, they didn't actually defeat him. Even when they got his, their hands on his own weapon to beat him, they didn't really beat him. And so to see what we got in the the movie versus what we've seen in the comic books, that's where a lot of disappointment for a lot of Marvel fans came from. Yep. Now the only other thing that a lot of the fans found frustrating, and this ties to having Gore the God Butcher in it, is them making this such a comedic movie. Where yes, there's been a lot of success on the Thor front in past movies by using comedy where when it came from, let's say the first Thor movie, all the way up until Thor Dark World where they were trying to take a more serious route, the seriousness wasn't necessarily working, being that Dark World is arguably one of the worst Thor movies. Now people are trying to say that this one's probably the worst Thor movie. Uh, but with Thor Love and Thunder taking it an extra mile, it's like we're gonna go straight comedy almost all the way through the entire movie. Like that's the route that they took. It wasn't bad and it wasn't good. But the biggest confliction is the possibilities versus what you get. That's what makes this movie so hard for fans to enjoy. Um, and, and they were right. I've heard some people talk about all the goats screaming. <coughs> Hilarious. But after a while, it's like, come on, guys. All right. <coughs> You're overusing it. <coughs> You're exhausting it. <coughs> There's no explanation for it. Making fun of the gods in the way that they made fun of the gods over and over. Making them seem like a joke. Being playful. Having all of these funny skits throughout the entirety of the movie. However, I believe that they did tackle this issue. They just didn't focus on the issue as much as they could have, especially by using Gore the God Butcher to focus on those things just a little bit more. Uh, but that's what's frustrated most, uh, most fans. But that leads us to, however, well, what's the plan of the MCU? What is the Marvel Cinematic Universe actually trying to do um, in this within phase four and even more so what what could we possibly be seeing more of within phase five and i would argue is that what they're actually tackling um is to communicate to the next generation i want to talk to the kids no god that seems to be their focus either communicating to the next generation or preparing the next generation of heroes right because, for example, when we look at WandaVision, in WandaVision, we're, of course, introduced to Monica Rambeau, which is introducing a new hero. But then we also see that her children are in it. Now, although her children are just someone ones that she's conjured, in Marvel Comics, her sons uh, become heroes known as Wiccan and Speedy, thus introducing, again, the next generation. Now, with Loki, the, the series of Loki, although it's not majorly focused on, they introduce Kid Loki, who is also ends up being a Marvel hero later on in Marvel Comics. When we look at uh, Captain America and the Winter Soldier, the young black man that is the grandson to the first uh, Captain America, or at least the black 
first Captain America. Uh, his son ends up becoming a hero known as Patriot. Hawkeye, we see Hawkeye's replacement, uh, Kate Bishop stepping up into that role of being Hawkeye. She's being introduced as well as the sister to Black Widow stepping into somewhat of a heroic role of her own within the same series of Hawkeye. More young heroes. When we look at the series of Miss Marvel, Miss Marvel herself is a young hero. As a matter of fact, one of the things that I pointed out in my Miss Marvel review is that Miss Marvel is one of the only heroes of Phase 4 to have an entire series dedicated solely to herself without the support or help from other heroes. She doesn't have Spider-Man, she doesn't have Iron Man, she doesn't have Captain America, she doesn't have Thor. She has no hero, not even her favorite hero, Captain Marvel, coming to her aid in, in her becoming the superhero, at least not right now. We will probably see that in the Marvel's TV series, but as of right now, she came up on her own with no help. Now, another is that we have is Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. With Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, who do we have? Not only the reintroduction of Wiccan and Speedy from a different universe, but you also have America Chavez being introduced here also. Again, another young hero. Not only that, we also have with our current series of, um... The, you, you, you can... the current movie of Thor, uh, Love and Thunder. We have these children, right? It's another frustration, right? This is another frustration. So to clarify, there is an instance near the end of the near the end of the um, movie where these kids were kidnapped by Gore, and these kids were being used to uh, used to set up a trap to capture, of course, Thor and Mighty Thor and all of them to go ahead and beat them. Uh, anyway, his end goal is to get to eternity. But in capturing these kids, Thor shows up to help them, and he shares his power with them. And in him sharing his power with these children, these children now have the power of Thor, and they end up going to fight. I have the power of God and anime on my side! Wait, you Again, demonstrating this aspect of empowering and strengthening the next generation to be able to stand up and fight and walk in heroism. We also have the son of Heimdall who steps up in some sense to kind of lead these children uh, because he's the one person who has access to his father's abilities to kind of see and communicate with those that he sees. And in the end of the movie, there's a training montage in some sense for these children to prepare them for battle and warfare. And so we see a lot of that being shown throughout the, this movie of the you know the kids being introduced and being focused on it and the kids stepping into a level of heroism. And of course, within this as well, like I said, we have female Mighty Thor stepping into a role of heroism. Now, if you're not paying attention to this aspect of what MC's phase, MCU's Phase 4 is attempting to introduce, if you don't see that they're attempting to introduce a new generation, it would make sense for this random introduction, introduction of kids helping to defeat Gore the God Butcher. As bad as this guy is in the comic books, it would make sense for that to be frustrating. It would make sense for those scenes to be annoying. It's like it was just thrown in here. But if you pay attention, that they're doing this on purpose because they've been doing this within other Marvel series and or movies is having the kids lead the way or step up in some form or fashion. So it's actually not as far off. <clears throat> it's actually not as far off as a lot of people are looking at this to be. If you're following along with what the MCU is doing, it's not as bad. If you are simply looking at every single movie, well, this is stemming from that, so it needs to be like that. If that's your perspective, you're not going to enjoy it. You're you're not going to see the goal, and, and it's not going to flow as effectively if you're not connecting the pieces that is being introduced. And that's what's going to hinder a lot of people. Uh, but it is, honestly, one of the few things that was able to keep me in the movie while well, there's so much that was actually kind of taking me out. I won't lie about that. Uh, even with the joking between the gods, although I thought it was excessive, which is some minuses in its own way, it makes sense for what it is that they are actually attempting to communicate. If you are to go back to the Moon Knight um, Disney Plus series, if you go back to that, you will notice that there's a similar aspect to this within their gods as well, where we're introduced to the Egyptian gods within the series, the Egyptian gods make it a strict expectation that no, none of the other gods have anything to do with the functions and going-ons of regular people. They need to stay out of it. But what they were missing out on in keeping that mindset of those old practices was they were missing out on the fact that a human being was looking to harness their power and use it to 
Simply put, create chaos or take their power into their own hands and use it mischievously. And so without them taking their doing something about the issues that they were facing, it was causing a problem. That's what we see with Zeus. And that's what we see with the, the other gods that are introduced within the movie. There are a lot of them that are, you know, hey, we're separating ourselves from the issues of our people. But in them separating themselves, thinking, you know, well, this is nothing to do with us. There's nothing we can do about it. Even with their own lives being threatened, then that causes a bigger problem, which is what allowed for Gore to get away with what Gore was doing. God's not being involved. And as we get into the Christian perspective here shortly, that partially actually tackles what a lot of people's issues with religion are in the first place. God's not getting involved, even when it is the God's problem. But here's a saving saving face that they used at the end of the movie. Yeah, baby! That's what I've been waiting for! To, to kind of tie everything in together, okay? One, the last thing, the last post credit scene that you see is you see Zeus survived an attack from Thor. And in Zeus surviving an attack from Thor and being tended to, he goes to express that, the, you know, human beings are getting out of hand. The people are getting out of hand. They think that we're a joke, which is literally what we saw all throughout the movie. Gods are simply a joke. They were just being, that's just funny. They're just goofy the entire time. And he's pointing that out. He's like, they think we're just a joke. It's time to show them what we're capable of. And he sends Hercules to, of course, go find Thor, which is something that ties back to Marvel Comics is that, that the rivalry and the relationship between Thor and Hercules. So now it seems as though they're preparing the stage for that to be introduced into the MCU. But they wrap up the type of conduct that we see within the movie of making everything playful and jokey by pointing out that the people think we're a joke. What makes this even funnier, actually, if you think back, this story is being told by Korg. And then with Korg telling the story, Korg is allowed to interpret or illustrate the story any way that he feels like. We'll tie that back once we get into the Christian perspective. But with Korg telling the story, it is left to be a bit comedic by his articulation of how everything went down. Him speaking of the conduct of the gods, him speaking of the, what Thor had to go through, even Thor doing goofy things. It's coming from Korg's perspective. That's one thing that I think is important too. We're seeing all of this from Korg. We're not immediately seeing this from what was actually happening. I'm just throwing that out there. That's just my opinion. But um, it's time. It's time. Okay, I'm gonna ask you one more time, bro. Are you sure you want to do this? Look, oh, I'm don't don't ask just me that. Making yes. sure that yes, I want to do this. I don't care. I don't. Care. I don't care. Right. It might get me. It might fight you canceled. On it. it might get me shut down. I trust Fine. you, man. I'll fight this on yeah. my other side. Let's. We're gonna do this. All right, everybody, it's time for us to get into the Christian perspective of this movie. And if I, if I have to be honest, <sighs> Thor Love and Thunder is probably the first movie that I would not immediately suggest to Christians. And when I say I would not suggest it to Christians, it's not a good, not necessarily a good movie for Christians. It's not even easy to find a positive and an enlightening gospel message within the movie. If anything, it might spark more concern than it does to spark anything of faith within a believer. There's opportunity, but not much. So right out the gate, within the beginning of the movie, you're getting this backstory of Gore. Gore and his daughter are traveling within this wilderness and this wasteland, doing everything that they could to survive without any access to water or food. Yeah, we're already, we're already hitting on that. Wilderness walk, we have nothing, but all we can have is to believe in the God that we serve. Come on, they're already doing it. Now, of course, his daughter dies. Yep, it's a little bit of spoiler, but oh well. His daughter ends up dying. And, and his daughter dying, you know, he almost gives up. But he ends up witnessing that there's an oasis near him where he was about to die. Why did an oasis show up? Well, the god showed up on his land, but the god wasn't there for him. The god was simply dead there doing their own thing. And it's believed to be like a god of light, as they articulated. Point number two. Got elect. They end up going, he ends up going in, partaking of the fruit, recuperating himself, and he starts to worship and acknowledge the God that he serves and, and telling him all that he's been through and, and he, he he looks forward to receiving of his eternal reward. And eternal reward. Point number three. And the God ends up laughing at him. 
the God ends up making fun of him, say, saying he means nothing, that he is of no value to me. I'll, you need to simply do what you're supposed to do, which is worship and acknowledge me, but I am not obligated to do anything for you. And, and shuns him and shoves off Gore. But Gore's like pleading and begging for his help, and he's con continually being laughed at by this God of light. And in the end, Gore almost gets killed by this God, but Gore gets his hand, ends up hearing a voice whispering to him as he's about to be killed and he gets his hands on what's called the necro sword uh which there's a lot of tie in between the necro sword and no no the symbiote god which may be introducing symbiotes into the marvel cinematic universe but we'll wait to see if that actually happens but gore gets his hands on the sword and kills the god that he worships a god of light who's supposed to provide him with an eternal reward even as he keeps his faith when he has nothing sounds a lot like you know Christian faith. But again, making light of it, making a joke of it, making it seem as though the God is false and even if the God exists, the God doesn't really care about us. And which ignites the hate that is within Gore the God Butcher, is believing that the gods don't really care about us, the gods aren't actually doing their job, and the gods all deserve to be destroyed. And from a Christian perspective, if they, it's not bad when it is a concern of the things that cause people to lose faith in the Lord. That's not the problem, or that's not of concern. But to use those specifics and those keynotes to then speak of a particular God who in some sense reflects, you know, the biblical God, especially one that a lot of people today relate to, that's hard to, to sit and just kind of witness that be played on yep. within a movie that you're hoping to be entertained by. And so that's the first thing right out the gate that immediately made the movie difficult to, to watch. I, I enjoy the, the storytelling between Gore wrestling with the fact that he's been betrayed by the guy that he worshipped and wondering if he, you know, saying, you know, well, I, I don't need to have this faith anymore because that just introduces into the movie what a lot of people also, where there are, yes, there are a lot of Christians in America. There are a lot of Christians in the entirety of the world. But then there are a lot of people who have lost faith. There are a lot of people that have no faith. One, because they're saying that there's no evidence. But two, there are those that have tested to see if God is real and haven't experienced anything for them to to have such a faith and so that in and of itself it doesn't just birth a lack of faith it doesn't just birth well I don't believe in God then there's a certain level of resentment uh, uh, aggravation and, and even hatred towards God for not being the God that he we preach about when we preach about who God is and so that's the that's the positive thing to know that we can acknowledge that that's real in our reality here but in another thing, in another sense, to to use God in that way, it either makes Gore look ignorant or it makes the people who created the storyline ignorant to to portray God in that fashion. Now to kind of introduce a little tie-in from the Bible itself, and this is more so to shed some light on the positivity of of the belief in the true and living God, the biblical God, Yahweh, as there are several of us that believe believe in in Him, the the God that the Christians serve, the God that the, the followers of Jesus serve and even the Hebrews that they serve, is in 2 Chronicles chapter uh, 28, you have where King Ahaz, King Ahaz has steered away from worshiping God so much so he was willing to actually worship the gods of Assyria and began to tear, to tear down the house of God, the temple that was made for God to build high places and places of worship and sacrifice for those gods because he witnessed what, the, what was being done for the Assyrians and he wanted the same thing and went to try and do those same things, but reproduced and got nothing out of that. There was no response. There was no blessings. And if anything, it's what led to his death versus leading to the prosperity of Israel. And so we see a worshiping of false gods. But the, the thing that we got to recognize with the introduction of, hey, worshiping false gods produces nothing is realizing that King Ahaz was already following or the Israelites were already following the true and living God and all he had to do was stick with that because throughout their history it shows evidence that God has always been there for them. There's a lot of evidence for that between Genesis, Exodus, going all the way up until 1st, 2nd Kings, all through there, there's God being present for the Israelites. So there's evidence for that yet he was still willing to go worship another God. Now we're going to go ahead and tackle the last two elephants in the room. That being the, the homosexuality that's being shown in the movie. Okay, I will go ahead and tell you guys. One, 100% biblically homosexuality is a sin. 
there's no denying that. I'm not going to play on that. I'm not going to act like I don't believe that. I do believe that it is a sin. As well as, I believe, several other sins of sexual... Other sins that we as people end up committing are just as bad as homosexuality. So we shouldn't treat homosexuality as being, you know, the worst of the worst. When what we do ourselves is just as bad. So that's something I want to point out. But the way that they introduce it in the movie and communicate it in the movie, I believe is concerning and detrimental. The reason I say that is in one sense they have Valkyrie and they expound a little bit more on her feelings and her attraction to women, okay? And Valkyrie being one of, I guess you could say, a, 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 a league or a legion of women warriors that were as guardians. And so with these women characters, what you have there is, of course, you know, she loves women. And you already see hints of that within Thor Ragnarok. So it doesn't come as a surprise to see Valkyrie act on those feelings and those attractions when you go to watch Thor Love and Thunder. It's like, okay, they've already introduced that. They've already been tapping on the door of that. So for them to give it a story makes it a bit more clear versus just saying and, and flaring it out there and putting it out there in everyone's face that that's what she is. It's a part of who she is. Okay, we understand that. It's not a problem. But where it became a bit more concerning is Although in Marvel Comics it's clear that Korg, which is the Rock character, is a homosexual character, turns out his entire race are homosexual uh, characters. And then, here's the thing with that though. One, in Thor Ragnarok, when Korg is introduced, there are no hints of that other than his faithfulness and commitment to Thor himself. Otherwise, there are no evidence to show that he was attracted to same sex, essentially. However, when we get into the movie of Thor Love and Thunder, they take this moment where Thor and Jane Foster are having an intimate moment to explain the way that his race is and how they function, which kind of gives this aspect of, this wasn't expected or set up and there's no reason for this to be brought up. Yep. That's that's where that ends up being concerning. So we're just, we're just gonna throw this in here. What's the point? Why was it necessary? It made no difference. It's just there. It plays no valuable part to the story itself. It serves no purpose other than to just say, hey, we're gay. It's like, okay, okay, whatever. But it gets more concerning because with the character of Korg, what they bring in is that when they are mating, coming together, they are actually what? able to reproduce as two male characters being able to reproduce, which yes, with the kids, it's easy for parents to simply teach that other kids, well, actually, that's not how reproduction works. That is a simple explanation. But to be forward with that within a movie like that, it, that's controversial, and that, that, personally, I have to say is concerning. As a believer in Jesus, that was concerning for them to have that in the movie. Now, the last elephant, as we draw this video to a close, is Thor himself, okay? One aspect of tech that takes place within Marvel Comics is it's within the Ultimate um, Avengers storyline where you have an instance in which Captain America is about to be used by uh, Loki. Loki is about to break out of Asgard and come and find him and he's looking to manipulate him because he's a man of faith and a man that believes in God which makes him a tool of susceptibility to this manipulation that Loki is looking to pursue. Now Thor gets wind of these plans and Thor goes to speak with, with Captain America to kind of set him straight, get him prepared, you know, get him out of his out of his way of thinking to kind of help him uh, instead of letting him be used. But what was frustrating to Thor was, Thor sees it's like, how does he have the faith that he has in this God and who he has not seen, but he has seen me standing here fighting alongside him and all of this, but he, he doesn't even believe me and what I'm trying to tell him. And that is confusing and conflicting for Thor. You, um, you had, you... You, you could, you do. And that's kind of something that I think they've tapped into within the entirety of this movie is this belief in Thor being a different God, a different type of God. Because it, like we see, Thor's the hero of this story. Thor's the God that's stepping up to fight on behalf of all of humanity to, to stop Gore from doing what Gore's trying to do, to stop Gore from his mission of getting rid of all of the gods. Gore's the, I mean, Thor's the one looking to do what needs to be done. Making him seem as though, oh, he's one of the good ones or he's a real god, right? That's that's what we get. But that's a, somewhat showing a similarity between uh, Thor and Jesus in the way that they're illustrating this. Now, how, how do I believe that? Well, first off, the focus here 
His store has been living amongst humanity for quite some time, uh, functioning like humans do, establishing friendships, relationships, going to battle for humanity, all of these things. Now with him doing all of this for humanity and with all that he has lost along the way, him losing his brother several times, thinking he's dead. That does psychological damage, by the way. Losing his mother, his mother dies. Losing um, Asgard itself. Thanos killing several, almost all of the Asgardians when he attacked and him having to live with that loss, not successfully de defeating Thanos in the first place and living with that, that loss for those first five years and then finally being him and going through all that they went through during Endgame, you know, that messes with you psychologically. And what we find with Thor in the introduction of this movie is him having this somewhat of an identity crisis. And that's, you know, knowing who he is, knowing who he wants to be, knowing what he wants to do, and grasping that. That's what he's been wrestling with the entire movie. I think they gave hints of that in the way that they did his wardrobes. Because in the beginning, you have him with the Guardians of the Galaxy, so his wardrobe reflects that of, dare I say, Star-Lord. He kind of looks like he's wearing Star-Lord's getup. So he's reflecting, you know, the person he's been following along with. So then when we see him end up going to, um, uh, where was it? He ended up going to the, the city of where the gods were. When he went to that city, he ended up having to snatch up the clothes of some of the um, other gods. Ironically, the emotional gods. I think that was, there was a purpose to that because now he has to come to terms and understand his emotions as a man. And, and so with him... Uh, dressing up like that he's becoming somebody or something else and so he ends up getting defeated and then later we see and in other points we see him just tap into his full wardrobe and even then when you look at his wardrobe it's like that it doesn't necessarily fit especially the helmet man oh what were they thinking with the helmet i thought that was probably the goofiest the goofiest look he's had the entire time it's the biggest piece of dog I can rock with the, the robe, the, the, the Star-Lord look. I can rock with that. Even him fighting like he's dang Jean-Claude Van Damme. I can live with all of that. But then when he put on that helmet, lost. I was like, what? Nah, get out. Come on, get out of here, bro. Nah, nah, that's crazy. <laughs> but but we see him going from different perspective of himself, different identity, different emotions, etc. We see this journey uh, with him. We even see him wrestling with the, the battle of love. And, and suffering, you know, the heartache of losing so many loves when him and Jane Foster fell out. And then him having, fighting to save her and protect her, but her yet still giving her life in the end of the movie. Uh, yep, I know that's a big spoiler, guys. It's okay. We'll live through it. We'll make it through it. But especially if you're going to decide after this video that you're not going to watch it. But anyway, Jane Foster dies, and he has to live with that loss, too. So there's, there's a lot of that happening within the movie but what this brings into which makes him seem so christ-like is hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 and the scripture reads for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin so what this what this verse is talking about this is hinting at the the what jesus has went through when jesus lived here in the earth when Jesus was alive here in the world, Jesus experienced all of the things humanity could experience. He experienced being faced, you know, with love, with anger, with, with being hungry and having to manage all of those things, having to work and feeling the pain of labor, you know, going without. He dealt with all of that pain. And he really dealt with pain with all that he went through on the cross and being beaten and being accused and being hated even after everything that he's done for the people. He dealt with all of those different types of emotions. He had to live through all of that. And of course, as we know, man, as King of Kings, man, he raised from the dead and he went to go live with his father and entrust us to go ahead and live out in the world. We're going to double back to that, that last part. He entrusts us with bringing people into the kingdom. But we see, right, Jesus lived here, experienced what we experienced and grasped what it is to be a human being. Thor's gone through those same things. Thor is grasping what it means to be a human being, grasping his emotions. Who do I want to be? What do I want to be? But at the end of the day, I do have to remember that I am a god, which makes, which is why he fought the fight that he fought was because, you know, I'm still a god, so I can't sit back and just watch the other gods die. And so th they, they really did a good job of, that's something that's, con uh, for me, a controversial, that's conflicting. Because on one hand, I get that they're depicting in some sense Christ by using Thor. Which is powerful because now, as us as believers, we can take that and extrapolate it to bring people back to Jesus. But on the other hand, like I said in Marvel Comics, it was, hey, notice me, Thor, since your God isn't proving himself. So that makes that, that's what makes that conflicting. 
Now they even went as far as to hit into how the old ways won't always work in a small way. They did this in a very small way. Because you see, what Asgard has done since, you know, their actual home of Asgard has been destroyed is they've made home here on Earth. And in making a home here on Earth, they have modernized themselves from clothing, from doing uh, um, shows and things for sightseeing and incorporating their technology with the way that people actually function here, having a presidency, doing advertisements and all of these things. This is what, what the Asgardians have now modernized themselves to do, not bringing home into the earth world their practices but instead conforming to theirs so when the children first got kidnapped like i said before the children get kidnapped by gore um, after the children got kidnapped you see that thor himself is walking up and trying to rally the people together and, and does his best to give this rallying speech but what you have happening on the other hand where that speech would work, he calls on the people, the people will listen, the people are ready, and they all charge off to battle. But when Thor goes to try and do this, you see the people all, you know, panicking, oh no, our kids are gone. You see people coming together and trying to say, hey, we can make this moment into a show. And then you have other people trying to pull a marker board together and write down these plans and schemes, and that even as Thor giving his speech, they're like, we're taking notes. And so they're, they're modernizing what would otherwise be a, um, they're modernizing something that would take a totally different approach when we're talking about old school or, or the, the old ways, um, but instead they were modernizing those approaches, which is scratching the surface of a lot of people believing that, you know, the old religions, their practices, their belief system, systems are outdated. They don't work today. They never worked. So we need to get rid of them and try to do something new. We, we see that with the way that they, as Asgardians, have been modernized, especially since Thor has been MIA. With Thor being gone, that even more so reduces the, the way that they uh, used to function. Now, I mentioned before that there was a scene in which the children had been freed by Thor and where they were about to fight some of the monsters that Gore himself was conjuring, that Thor had decided that he's going to empower the children to be able to fight against this opposition, to fight against those monsters by using his own power. And so he, he gives them the power of Thor. But he says, I give it to you temporarily, but here you have my power. And they go on, and even though they've never fought before, they, those kids go in. And honestly, I know a lot of people were mad that the kids got those powers. I thought that fight scene was amazing. That fight scene was fun. Even the stuffed animals out there doing damage, man. I swear, that, that scene was actually pretty funny and encouraging when you're thinking of it, again, from the perspective of, we're empowering the next generation. I thought that that was a powerful message. I thought that that was impactful, which doubles us again back to scripture where we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 in the Bible is speaking of how Christ has given us different gifts to each and every person in the world to be able, of course, to do his will. He has empowered us. When Jesus ascended after rising from the dead to go and dwell with his father, he sent down the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells within us and that Holy Spirit connects with the giftings that God has given us and, and empowers us to use those gifts to go against the enemy. And so, and even more so to protect us, protect our household, to lead people to Christ. Those gifts allow for us to do that. And and then 1 Corinthians 12, it speaks of those gifts. And, and so that, that connects here with what we see happening in the movie. And, and that leads me back. You can take that either way. It's positive because we can take that and make it a gospel message, but at the same time, it, it, it's interpreting that Thor's doing this and not Jesus. That Like, it's almost intentional. Thor's doing this and not Jesus. So that's something that is, I'm on the, I'm on the fence about. But that brings me to my next piece. Um, they talk about uh, adoption. There's a combination. There's something I want to combine here. Uh, adoption and love. Okay, with Gore, Gore was somebody who lost his daughter. And he lost his daughter not because of the gods, but because the gods weren't who he believed the gods to be because he had been taught to believe that gods were that way. Yeah, I know that was a tongue twister. The gods failed him. Where he needed the gods to be there for him, the gods failed him, which is what sent him on his rampage in the first place. Now, another spoiler. What he ended up looking for, which takes away from the actual character of Gore. Gore wouldn't have done this. Gore, and, and all, as a matter of fact, would have killed him. Gore was looking for, in the movie, eternity. Eternity is a cosmic entity. 
and cosmic entities are separate from the pantheon of the gods. They're 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 something different entirely. They're actually stronger than the gods. So, you, but you technically can consider them gods. It's complicated. It's, that's the Marvel Cinematic Universe hierarchy when we're talking about divine beings. But eternity grants one wish to anyone that finds eternity. And Gore was able to find eternity. Not only did Gore not try to kill eternity, Gore wanted to wish on eternity. And what we thought Gore wanted to do in wishing on eternity was, you know, wish the the uh, eradic the eradication of all the gods. But he ends up, in some sense, wanting to wish for the his daughter back. But at the same time, being that the Necrosword was destroyed, he um realizes, you know, hey, I'm about to actually die. What would be the point of wishing my daughter back? Um, and, and what we have happening here in this moment is we have Thor having his talk no jutsu Naruto moment where he's talking to, to Gore about, you know, with everything that he's went through, with everything that he's lost, that the one thing that even keeps Thor going is his faith and love. And so what we have there is Thor teaching a lesson of love, which is the lesson that Jesus himself teached all throughout his life being here, is that in spite of any law that any man can follow, to say that they're being obedient to God and doing the will of the Lord is to demonstrate love unto the people. Even more so, scripture speaks of, how can you say that you love me if you cannot demonstrate that you love your neighbor? But he, we see this lesson of love being taught to Gore, which results in Gore wishing his daughter back to life. And, and uh, now this, this in, in and of itself is a savoring moment when we're talking about the message. And the only reason that that moment is conflicting is because it's not something you would expect from Gore. It's just like, what? You, you, you could just give Gore a, a good couple of words, uh, but you got to pay attention to the movie. You see, what they pointed out was the Necrosword corrupted Gore. It wasn't that Gore was manipulating and controlling the power. He's being manipulated himself. So where he wasn't a... Oh, that was another piece of that. Whoo! I don't think I'm going to be able to cover all of it. But that was another piece to it. The weapon was manipulating him and using him. But at the end of the day, due to all the damage that he had suffered, that's what brought him on to the brink of death. So when they destroyed the sword and he got to eternity, he was more so thinking for himself rather than thinking from the influence of the necro sword. So that's where, one, he's able to wish for his daughter back to life. Too, that's where he's more receptive to the kind words and the lesson of love that Thor is giving. So that's one thing that you got to pay attention to when watching that movie. That's why that, that was able to be introduced there. But that love, that message of love, is the same message that Jesus taught, thus giving giving Thor a bit more of a Christ-like mindset and character when we're looking at the movie. Which leads me to my last point that I want to make is, is an adoption. What happens at the end of the movie is... Well, first, before we get into that, what ends up happening earlier on in the movie when Thor was empowering those children, one of them tells him, well, I'm from this race. And another, another one was like, well, we're from this planet. And so they've been taking in strays and people from different countries and different races into Asgard on Earth. And so Thor says, well, you're all Asgardians now. So <laughs> it's kind of what Jesus it's kind of what Jesus did. It's like, you, you have people that are being ministered the gospel. And it's like, well, I'm from Africa. I'm from Rome. And I'm from Japan. And he's like, well, you're all Christians now. You're all followers of Jesus. If you're trusting me, if I'm going to be empowering you, if you're listening to me, if you're going to follow me, then you are your believer in Jesus now. So that's, that actually is what that made me think of. But that is connecting back to how Christ has adopted the rest of the world in. Where the, the Jews were the the original chosen people of God, that was just the starting place for what God was looking to do in the end, which is allow for the entirety of the world, all people, all races, all cultures, and all belief systems to, you know, of course, you know, give up their own belief systems, to come and to, to trust in the Lord and to follow Christ. That's what Christian means, follower of Jesus. And so we, we see that relationship there, Thor being Christ-like, even more so. At the end of the movie, the ultimate adoption happens. Where Gore wished back his daughter, Gore himself ended up dying. And where Thor ended up losing Jane Foster, he ends up adopting in and taking in Gore's daughter. Teaching her, training her, and taking her on his adventures as he's going to these different planets and helping people fight and end their wars. They have partnered together in this father and daughter-like relationship. By the way, it was a very beautiful scene, very beautiful moment. Even seeing the little lady weird, I think she was building um, Stormbreaker. Uh, at the end of the movie and so to see her wielding Stormbreaker I thought that was pretty cool um, 
but we see that adoption, that willingness to adopt. Because not only do we, not only is that powerful, because you know, hey, he has someone to replace Jane Foster and show love to, but it shows Thor living up to the words and the expectations that he gave to Gore. It wasn't like I'm taking this little girl in now I'm about to treat this little girl like trash because she's the daughter of the person that led up to the death of my love. It wasn't like that. Thor lived up to the same words that he was speaking. And so that's meaningful. And you can find that in John chapter 14, verse 18. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world seeth me no more. But ye see me because I live, ye shall live also. At the day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. There's almost also Romans chapter 8 verse 11, which reads, And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. These verses are hinting at that, you know, it's not just, well, I'm going to follow Jesus and Jesus is going to continue to live separate from me. What we got first in John is what we see is that when he says he's not leaving you comfortless, he is hinting at the upcoming of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is what, when Jesus goes up to dwell in the kingdom of heaven, the Holy Ghost comes down in his place to dwell within you, which is allows for you to still stay connected to Jesus, to still stay connected to God, to have God with you always. And that's what we see also in that verse. Those that believe, you know, if you believe in me, then I go before my Father for you. And we are all as one. We are all connected. Just as just as this little girl was adopted into Thor's life, into Thor's heart, and welcomed into his family, and becoming his teacher. The same thing happens for us that believe in Jesus, is that Jesus welcomes you in if you believe in him. And he will not only simply give you power, but he will also continue to show you his love. And even more so, allow for you to demonstrate that same love into the rest of the world. Now, I want to say thank you guys for tuning in and watching this video with me. I pray that this video has blessed you and has shown you some things and when looking at Thor, Love and Thunder. This may be the first movie that I actually kind of shoot down, but at the same time, you, if you feel led, watch it for yourself and come to your own conclusions. Thank you guys, and I hope you have a blessed day. Peace.